Good evening, I'm calling the Monday, December 9th, 2019 Planning Commission meeting to order. Will everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, first thing on the agenda is the approval of tonight's agenda. Would anyone like to make any changes? All right, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Move to approve. Second. All right, I have a move from Commissioner Kirk and a second from Commissioner Farr. All those in favor of approving the agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, agenda is approved. Next up, approval of the minutes from the uh, Planning Commission meeting held on Monday, November 18th, 2019. Do you have any requests for changes or concerns? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'll move to approve the Planning Commission minutes dated November 18th, 2019. All right, motion by Commissioner Farr. Do I have a second? Second. And a second by Commissioner DeSanctis. All those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, minutes are approved. Moving on tonight, we have a public hearing. This is for Central Middle School 2019-22. This is a request for a planned unit development concept review on 57.4 acres, planned unit development district review with waivers on 57.4 acres, site plan review on 57.4 acres, preliminary plat to combine multiple parcels into one lot on 57.4 acres. Would the proponent of the project please step forward? Good evening. Would you state your name for the record and would you tell us about your project please? Good evening, my name is Jason Mutzenberger. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Business Services for Eden Prairie School District. And I have a team with me, our architect and our civil engineer. I'll let them introduce themselves. Thanks. I'm Michael DeVetter with uh, DeVetter Design Group. Group. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Jay Pomeroy with Anderson Johnson Associates, Golden Valley. Thank you. We do have a presentation uh, this evening, just a, a few slides to go through. Just to talk a little bit about the process that we went through as a school district, uh, we started uh, a process called Designing Pathways back in 2016. And it was really a process to define what is our academic plan for the next 10 years in the district. And what that really led us to is this is gonna require some facility adjustments in order to meet our academic plan. Um, what we did is a, a lengthy process that involved staff, involved students, community, parents, um, and we went through a, a long process that covered about three years. Um, where we uh, did many different types of formats from online surveys, we did small groups with individuals, we did large group formats, um, a number of different avenues in order to gain feedback. We created plans and then brought them back to those groups, went through some iterations of those, um, and in the end created what we felt was really four priorities for the district uh, to move forward with what we call designing pathways. The first one was to improve the middle school experience. Right now, uh, Central Middle School is grades seven and eight, um, we are one of the only seven, eight middle schools in the, the state of Minnesota. Um, there are seven through nine schools, there are five through eight schools, um, but there, uh, most of them are six through eight. And we really felt that a two year period for a band of middle school students isn't long enough for them to develop friendships, develop kind of their identity moving from an elementary school before they hit that crazy high school that we have. Um, and so uh, we felt like it was most appropriate age-wise for them to move to a, a six, eight middle school experience. Um, with that, um, we talked about moving our four-year-old preschool pro program, which is a centralized program located uh, both here at the Education Center um, and then also at Lower Campus um, in our facility at the Administrative Services Center. Um, what we feel is a benefit there is really to get those four-year-old preschool kids ready for kindergarten. Um, we have a pilot program working at Cedar Ridge Elementary right now, um, and they've been in process for two years now, um, and it's really a benefit to those youngsters to try and get acclimated to the building, to the teachers, to how do you do lunch and recess, and just that normal flow um, that happens at an elementary school. 
It also allows us to reduce some lease costs, um, which we've been working with the city on um, as we lease space from the city, um, and, and really just become our own entity in, in driving our costs with our own facilities. Um, the third improvement we would like to make with Design Pathways is really safety and security across all schools. We've got a number of initiatives already in the works and have been for a number of years, but we want to continue to grow that. And then uh, redesigning classrooms as well across all of our sites, not just the middle school, but all of our sites. The project you have in front of you this evening is really just to improve the central middle school location, which is uh, some building additions and renovations within that site. Um, we went to the community in May of 2019 this year uh, with a uh, referendum uh, for $39.9 million. It passed at nearly a 70% passage rate. We had more non-parents vote uh, for that referendum than we had parents, so we were really pleased with the success of that campaign. Um, and it covered a whole list of things that I'm going to let the architect jump into and what those building additions and renovations look like. How do I get this? Oh, there we go. So as Jason uh, alluded to, the, the, the referendum passed in 2019, and we've been working on it ever since. The, the focus of, of the, the, um, the referendum was to add additional classroom space to the Central Middle School to accommodate the sixth grade uh, coming to, this, uh, to CMS. But as also as part of this uh, project, we, we also are uh, we added a new a performing arts uh, center. Uh, we expanded the the, uh, the cafeteria space and added a new gymnasium space. So let's see. Here. Oh. Oops, sorry. So I think. So this is a, uh, a rendition of, a uh, plan rendition of the, uh, the current design for Central Mi Middle School. Thank you. So um, the, the, the plan is actually uh, oriented uh, with east to the up and west down. That kind of follows the way we're doing our construction documents. Um, I'm going to start on the west side where uh, I think most of you are familiar with Central Middle School. There's an existing white canopy uh, entrance. That's actually going to be removed as part of this project. And we're adding a new entrance to the new made entrance at Central Middle School. That's the curved space to the, to the bottom, just to the right of the, uh, uh, the Performing Arts Center. So what this allows us is to create a new secure entrance, but it also allows us to create a new public entrance to the facility. The uh, um, uh, public will be able to come in this entrance and either go to the left to the new Performing Arts Center or actually to the right to where the new uh, gymnasium complex will be. The, the uh, Performing Arts Center actually is a new 700 seat, it's really a high performing uh, theater with, uh, it has a control booth, it has an orchestra pit, it has audio visual design, and it's really designed for as a high functioning uh, performance that are similar to what's uh, what's currently out at the at the high school, and at the back side of the theater, we actually are moving the the uh, uh, music classrooms, which are currently on the east side of the building, down to the west side of the building. So we're really creating a new performance wing to Central Middle School to highlight really the the exceptional uh, music uh, educate music and performance education in Eden Prairie. Uh, as you go to the right or, or to the south, there's going to be a new gymnasium, really primarily focused on a classroom. Uh, it's really a classroom space for the sixth graders as they come over. But what it does also is, if you look at it, we now have the ability to com combine three gymnasium facilities into one space so that it gives the school district and the community the opportunity to have larger events, larger basketball tournaments, all kinds of things in this area because of adding, uh, because we're adding the gymnasium. Um, also, as part of that, there'll be we're going to improve the locker room spaces and actually add another locker room for the sixth grade. As you go to the east, that's where the really the main focus of of the project is, and that's where we're adding. Um, well, with remodeling and addition, we're adding 26 classrooms to this, to the building. 
And what's really interesting about it is we're really, if you re look really closely at the classroom, there's three different variants of classroom. What we're trying to do is really push the envelope on education so that we're trying to create more collaborative educational spaces um, so that students have ch student choice in education. And that's really the focus of the East Wing. Um, we're in that, that space, we have collaborative classrooms, we have traditional classrooms, and then we have uh, lab classrooms. And just to the right or to the south of the classroom addition, that's where we're, we're adding a 6,000 square foot cafeteria addition. And what that's gonna allow, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with CMS, but currently there's two um, cafeterias, one on either side of the kitchen, and there really is no access to daylight. They're really not the most pleasant spaces in the building. And you'll see later when we look at the, the perspectives, what we're doing is really, we're adding a large expanse of uh, uh, glass to the east, and we're connecting the, the seventh grade and the eighth grade cafeteria with the link uh, where our, our addition is. And what that's gonna do is allow the, the district to go from five lunch periods down to three lunch periods to, to mo more reflect how people eat lunch. So the kids aren't gonna have to start eating lunch at 10 o'clock, now they're gonna be able to wait till 11 or, 11 or 11.30 to eat lunch. So they have a more normal lunch period. And it also allows this space to be used more for education throughout the rest of the day. Um, and then there, if you look at it, with, interspersed between, within the existing facility, there's um, ancillary remodelings. We're gonna add some additional classrooms in a part of the space and then within the, um, within the, the heart of the school, if, once again, if you're familiar with the school, there's really long un unarticulated corridors. We're trying to open that up. So the gold spaces within the existing building, they're um, open resource areas where we're trying to make the corridors be a little bit more pleasant. And they're also trying to give the students opportunities to have collaborative learning throughout the existing building. So really what we're trying to do is tie the east and the west of the building together so that it all re reads as a unified whole. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, Julie, you can go to that, thank you. The, the additions now north is up. Um, the additions that Mike spoke of are, are um, I'll go to maybe the east side of the site first, the bus corral side, where the additions will, in essence, push the bus corral further to the east. With the addition of sixth grade, there'll be eight, eight additional buses required. So that bus corral moves to the east toward Wallace. Um, so we're reconstructing the entrance off Wallace. As it comes up the hill, you can see the old drive just south of the tennis courts um, to gain some, some distance and some better sloping. Um, we've kind of put a little curve into it. Um, special ed buses will be right at the north end of the bus corral and then only buses are really in the bus corral during the school day. It will be striped for event parking, for open houses, theater events, um, during off hours, and we can get upwards of about 80 cars in that bus corral during uh, off time events. Um, at the south end, southwest corner of the bus corral is the service area, uh, which will be relocated or pushed out again with those classroom additions or the cafeteria addition. As you go north of the bus corral, there is a northern drive that links the two parking lots together now. Um, that drive, we put a lot of effort into, again, linking the two sides, but actually to provide a connection more delineated, more descriptive to the parents so that during the afternoon they have two options. They can go back down to Scenic Heights or they can actually go along the North Road out the bus corral when the buses aren't have already left down to Wallace. That's part of, I'll touch a little bit on the um, traffic control, or traffic study that Bolton and Mink is doing on behalf of the school with the um, city staff. Um, again, on the east side, or I'm sorry, west side of the site, the large parking lot between ASC and um, CMS will be reconfigured. The parking will be rotated 90 degrees so that um, parents, staff, faculty or parking can now walk with the traffic, not against traffic. They're not crossing parked cars. And um, 
per city requirements. We've also highlighted the pedestrian paths within the parking areas, um, colored concrete, to get from the parking stalls to whether it be the fine arts entrance, the main entrance, as Mike mentioned, is being redone, or the gymnasium, I don't know if that's the name of it, but the southern, southwestern entrance of the school. Um, landscaped islands will be incorporated into the wide open asphalt that's, that's there now. The plan right now is to reclaim and repave that western parking lot, um, give it a, a facelift if, bud if budget allows, but regardless, the parking will be rotated. Um, there are several stormwater features. Um, while I'm on the west side there, off the southwest corner of the west parking lot, you can see the green landscaped basin down there. We've actually taken some of the parking out, reducing hard surface and putting in a, a rain garden infiltration basin in that location. And then off to the north side of the Fine Arts Center or theater, there's a large infiltration basin there which will be used for um, biology class, education, that type of thing. Um, not shown on the plan because it's underground, under the bus corral will be treating that water with underground chambers. There's quite, as you probably know, quite a relief in that area. Trying to manage the water in that area, really our only option was underground storage. Um, with the bus corral and the north uh, drive connection, we've dislocated or, or necessitated the relocation of the running track. So that's shown as well, moving more northward. Um, as well, those two brown squares just to the left of it, those are relocated sand volleyball courts. Um, the, the two baseball fields or softball fields, one right center in the middle of the site and one off to the northeast corner, those will remain. Those don't have to be touched. Um, Maybe to touch on it real quick, the traffic report, as I mentioned, really highlighted the necessity for, or um, the requirement to get more queuing lane. So as parents come off Scenic Heights Boulevard, they'll come north up School Drive and immediately south of the gymnasium addition. I don't know if Julie, you can put the, yeah, right in there. That's where the queue line, the queue lane begins and it goes all the way up to the Performing Arts Theater where we've got, I think, seven, 800 feet of queuing lane a lot more than the, probably, I think it was 150 or 200 that they have now. So we're really emphasizing parents getting off of the main drive and queuing and being able to stack. What's not included in this proposal right now, it's again being drafted and um, entertained with the traffic report, is the connection at School Road and Scenic Heights Boulevard. Um, Obviously there's traffic issues down there. The traffic report is, is addressing those, whether it's controlled intersection or roundabout or who knows, that's still in the works. So um, that, did you go over uh, timing or is that gonna be discussed here? Uh, just briefly, um, first phase, and Mike can help me out on this. First phase is ultimately going to be um, constructed this summer, that's Primarily the bus corral, west half, or east half of the site. 2021, finalizing in 2022, will be the west half of the site, including that scenic heights connection. Am I right on that? Okay. okay. Um, I'm sorry, when do the sixth graders start going? Sixth graders would move in fall of 2021. Yeah. Okay. So all construction would be completed by August of 2021, um, with the exception of possibly the Performing Arts Center, which may need a little bit, a few more months to complete and wrap up. But uh, the other work would be done substantially complete by fall of 21. Um, the uh, existing uh, CMS. Uh, facility. I think most, when I said, if are you familiar with it, everybody shook their head, so I'm assuming that you are. It's a fairly complex building. It's kind of been assembled over a period of time. Um, it's a, there's a number of courtyards, but it's a fairly large building. It's, I believe, two and a half football fields in the north-south direction and two footballs in the east, football fields in the east-west uh, direction. And as a design team, we, we, we wanted a way to not replicate what was there to continue uh, the existing, uh, this reddish 
brick. We wanted to find a way to actually add some more uh, articulation to the building to help break it down. So we made a conscious effort to step away from the existing uh, brick to, uh, and we're, we're using a, a darker brick on all of our additions, trying to, you know, we're trying to complement, but trying to accentuate some of the work we're doing. And actually, if I, I step out here, the, uh, this is a color palette of the brick, or the, of the building. So the existing building is a reddish brick similar to that. Is it possible for that to sit up, or is it too tall? Or too tall? So Thank the you. Building is more of a reddish brick like this, but it, it's reddish brick, and then there's some cement panel, and then obviously glass. But for the most part, it's this color. And what, we're, what we want to do is bring in a different color to help break that scale down. And actually, we want to work towards uh, the um, work towards some of the district branding. Uh, the district itself is going through a rebranding exercise, and their colors are red and black. And we're trying to introduce those into the building in a really natural way. So um, we're going to use the, the black brick, and then you'll see in the perspectives, we're using red in a really controlled way, just at the main entrances or at areas where we want to uh, give emphasis or highlight uh, areas of the building. Obviously, our reds are really difficult built, you know, to have a lot of red, so that's really our, our, our strategy there. And then the rest of the building, uh, we're using a, a silver metallic uh, metal panel. And the reason for that is it has a tendency to get lighter in, uh, when it's on the building. It will reflect the sun. You know, it changes colors during the day and it, it has a tendency to lighten buildings up. And then you'll see in the perspective we're also using uh, on the, as you approach from the south, of, uh, a large wall of cow wall, once again, to try to create some entrance interest on that facade since it's a, such a primary facade when you're uh, driving in. Um, and then obviously we'll have glass and then we'll have a combination of silver and black uh, moldings. So, we look at this. We can have the PowerPoint again, please. Thank you. So this is uh, uh, a perspective as you approach the building from the east. Uh, currently, if you, if, if you approach from the east to the left is the existing, uh, what used to be the, uh, uh, theater, the old theater from the high school. It's now a multi-purpose room. But for the most part, that elevation is all that reddish color brick. And so what we're doing on the left-hand side, that's the cafeteria that I was referring to. You can see the big, large expanse of glass. It's framed in a, a black brick, and we're, we're offsetting that with the silver metallic, in this case, the... Uh, their logo and their identity element. In the center, that's where most of the classroom spaces are, and that's where we're introducing the met, uh, metal panel. And once, you, once again, you can see how using the metal panel and the brick together helps to break that elevation down. And then on the right-hand side, that's uh, also part of the classroom addition, but it's actually pulled out. So the, the building articulation follows the massing. So, uh, once again, this is another, this would be the, the main student entrance from the buses. So this is one of the main bus entrances. And this is, uh, once again, from the east. And I think we have another one from the east also. Um, to, and then you can see the red. That's where the main entrances are. So as we go around the building, you'll see that at the red, we're using a little bit of that red to articulate where the entrances are. This, this is on the west side, this is the main performing arts center. So if you recall, that's where that white canopy currently exists. We're taking that down and this curved element out front, that's the main entrance. And, and that is where we're putting that metal panel. And we're offsetting the metal panel uh, with the black brick. So we're, we're trying to play, uh, create layers through the building with the metal panel, the brick, the metal panel. And you can get a slight glimpse of that, that red at the main entrance. Um, th that's right there at the main entrance. Uh, another image of it, you can see the red a little bit better. He, off to the left, that's really the, the color of the existing building, that orange-red color. That's it? Oh, the, there's, oh, I thought there was a, one of the gym. Okay, I guess that's it. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you. 
Nice presentation. Uh, any initial questions from the co commission? Commissioner Sanctus. I have several questions. One is, as you know, that elevation where CMS sits is one of the highest elevations in the area. I think it's around 905 feet above sea level. And I think scenic heights is about 875, 880. Now, right now, you have security lighting on the southeast, east side. How will the security lighting change? And I'm also concerned about the light signature, given its elevation relative to the surrounding residential area. You might have to talk about yeah. on the on the wall itself of the building. The the site lighting will be uh, removed and replaced with LED fixtures that are going to focus obviously the light down much uh, in more of a direct pattern. As far as the security lighting, though, I think is what you're asking for on the buildings. I don't know wall packs and things like that. Yeah, I mean, we'll have standard uh, uh, lighting on it just for security around the building. There, there will be um, along that in that main entrance, we'll have uh, light standards or pole lighting in, as you come into the main building. Is that what you're asking? Well, right now you have a number of positioned security lights that I think are on all night, a very intense white light. I'm not sure what kind of light source it is, but I'm wondering you're going to have more of those poles kind of in a perimeter around the buildings, the Performing Arts Center, and north of the revised CMS building. Yeah, the, 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 I'm, I'm not familiar, actually, with the lights you're talking about, so I, I, don't, I don't know exactly. But the, in, the intent is just to have a low-level security around the building, not to light up the the parking lot like it, it's game day every day. As opposed to, say, uh, Miller Park, where they have very intense lights during the football games, soccer matches, and so forth. Those lights are very apparent, although they do go off probably around 10.30, 10, 10.30, 10, mm -hmm. when the games are over. Yeah, so we don't have any, I, I don't believe the existing football field is going to have a lighting like that. So, I mean, really, we don't have those types of functions. We do have functions that are going to occur after hours, and that's the gymnasium function and the theater function. Yes. But they're not field functions, so there'll be um, a low level, you know, a security lights on the parking lot, but they're not to light up like a, a ball field or a game field. So more focused lighting. Right as opposed to diffuse, very broad illumination. Right, so the, 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 yeah. right. So we're not trying to, once again, we're not trying to light up a field, we're just trying to maintain security around the building. I, I'm not sure about the lights you're referring to, so I don't exactly know what they're for. Well, when you're standing on Scenic Heights Road and you look up School Road, they would be directly up the hill and to the right. On, uh, up to the hill and to the right, so they're to actually the right. on the building? To the north of the Scenic Heights School Road intersection and then to the right of that, around the back of the uh, uh, wetland. Yeah, back right between the building and the wetland. Right. I, I'm not sure what those are. I mean, I could find out what those are. Sure. But the, the intent is not to light up the building. The, the intent is, obviously, when we have a performance, there's a lot of glass on the building. So there'll be light from the building. But the intent is not to light up the building so that you can play a, an athletic event. All right. Another question I have is the the window for construction is fairly lengthy, correct? I mean, you're well, not, not one given, year. Uh, yeah, not given the complexity of the project that we have. So our construction is going to start in April, as soon as we can get in the ground in April. April. And it, and it's going to you know go a full year, and then we're going to the goal is to be, get into that next school year. And to do a performing arts center, those are really complicated buildings to build. Um, that's a pretty tight timeline for that performing center. And so I anticipate that you're going to have a fair number of truck traffic, construction traffic going yep. down scenic heights from 212 and then turning up School Road, I assume, or some coming in from Wallace Road. So that's something where we have to work out with. I'm not exactly sure. I would imagine a lot, depending on which side of the building we're working on. Some would maybe be coming up Wallace Road. Some will be coming up uh, Senior Heights Road, I think. Well, one of the questions I have is, what is the load limit on Scenic Heights Road? I'm just concerned uh, about the wear and tear on the surface of the road 
as construction proceeds? Yeah, so I, I don't know what the load limit is, but I mean, as we get into construction, we're working with con, con, Newson Construction. That will be in their purvey to make sure that we're, main, you know, we're following the local uh, load limits on the roads. And we won't start, one of the re reasons that we can't start too early in the spring is we have to wait till frost is out. We either have to get equipment there bef while frost is still in, or we have to wait till frost is out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Farr. A <coughs> uh, few questions for me, for you. Uh, very comprehensive project. Appreciate the great plans and introduction. Um, question about just student population impacts that it, this project is uh, trying to absorb. Uh, you spoke about the uh, drop-off demand and uh, I want to maybe ask a question about that as to whether or not um, most of the drop-off demand is a trend that you're seeing or is it the addition of the sixth grade class parents that are dropping off and if we ought to work on some incentivizing to make kids take the bus more and parent drop off less as part of the traffic management program. Um, I'm going to ask all three student population questions at once. You can answer them one by one. That was, that was one, so about that student drop off. Uh, second is the lunchroom size. It looks like you're uh, adding about 50% more. You have seventh grade and eighth grade lunchroom, and then we're adding about another 6,000 square feet. So to me, that's the sixth grade coming in. And then we're also reducing the lunch periods from five to three. And I didn't see like a kitchen expansion or anything. So we're making more meals, but, um, but, but it seems like the space is being used for the sixth grader. So I'm just wondering where you're making up that efficiency that mm -hmm. I just didn't see. And, this, and the third, maybe overarching question I have on, is the general demographic of our student population over the next, let's say, 10 years. Are we designing for year two, year 10, year 20? What's happening to the, the demographic of Eden Prairie kids, and where, where's your target to hit this building? Wonderful. Great questions. Um, so I'll start up at the top. Um, so student drop-off. Right now, I think... Um, if you drive scenic heights during drop off or pick up at the end of the day, you see um, you have some wait time on scenic heights and school road. There's definitely a traffic uh, concern at that that point. Um, we see sixth grade adding. Uh, so sixth grade is about a third more students to that building. Each grade level, six, seven and eight are approximately the same number of students, um, somewhere between 625 and 675 per grade level. Um, so we see traffic impact uh, at about a third of an increase um, to the current. We don't expect necessarily uh, more students to either drop off or take the bus. We're assuming um, that the pattern will remain the same. And so that's the traffic study is, is accounting for a third increase um, to our demand. Does that help with the first question on? That helps. I was, could you just tag on to that maybe an opinion about uh, a uh, strategy to reduce the number of parent drop offs? Yeah, we've talked about that internally in the district of is there a way that we can get more uh, families to take the bus. We certainly know at an elementary level um, that we have a higher uh, ride share, uh, bus share, um, than we do as, kids, as students get older. Um, and there are a number of dynamics to that. Um, certainly in high school they have uh, personal vehicles they can drive. Um, but at middle school we see um, parents driving more. And I think that's somewhat to do with athletic schedules and some uh, before and after school programming that kids can access. Um, I think uh, sixth grade, I don't know that um, we necessarily have a strategy at this point to, to continue to increase that ride. We would love to have every student in the district uh, take buses. Um, that would be our most efficient mode of transportation. And I think from a city traffic flow standpoint, that would be our most efficient way to go than individual cars um, coming to drop off students. So we're in that conversation of how can we increase and message for sixth grade uh, to continue to increase. Um, but we uh, don't have a, a specific strategy laid out to communicate with those families yet. We communicate every year, multiple times a year with families to try and um, encourage them to take the bus. They receive lots of information every year. Um, and that's part of our, just our written communication to them, but um, nothing additional at this time. Um, second question was around cafeteria. Um, so first of all, all high school food, um, major food is prepared, or all school food is prepared at the high school. We have a production kitchen at the high school, one of the largest production kitchens in the state of Minnesota. Um, that food is then uh, delivered to each site. 
and the, the sites are really geared towards warming food and then preparing some um, minor food vegetables that they might steam or, or some of those other ancillary items. Um, so the size of the kitchen is not required to increase because we have more students. We'll just uh, deliver more food to the site. Um, we do have um, uh, a few adjustments to the kitchen as we'll be serving more kids at one time. So we need to make some adjustments just from uh, the number of lines that we have for kids to be able to access food, um, to return trays, to um, do those types of things. So we've made some adjustments just to the serving lines uh, for that. Uh, the, the idea is right now we do have two grade levels. Um, serving in that cafeteria. Um, one side is 7th grade, one side is 8th grade. Right now there's five lunch periods. Um, you're correct in that we're adding a significant amount of square footage, about half uh, to that space. The idea is that we're now going to serve just 6th grade at one time, 7th grade at one time, and 8th grade at one time. Each will have their own lunch period. Um, the cafeteria as it lays out in kind of a U-shaped format really provides three distinct areas for us to supervise and manage behavior um, and kind of transitions for the kids uh, as they eat lunch. Um, so I think it, it's actually going to provide a really nice opportunity for us to, to do some additional positive behavior influence and control uh, that environment. Um, so the kitchen won't change much other than a couple serving lines and then the size will be able to accommodate the number of students in each grade level and planning for multiple years to come and, and the change that we're expecting over time. You did ask what does our demographic look like um, as we project forward over the next decade and this plan really is our 10 year uh, facility improvement plan to the site. Um, we definitely see demographics continuing to change. We don't see that necessarily changing our education delivery. Um, we feel like um, our delivery of personalized learning and that's really what our goal is. On the first slide um, we had up there, I didn't mention it, um, was really talking about four C's, that collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. Um, those are really those kind of soft skills that we're trying to develop in kids and it's how do we deliver those and we feel like the best way is uh, really through personalized learning. We want to reach each student um, within each classroom. Uh, and target them. We want to learn their skills, their needs, their wants, their desires, their interests um, and talents and try and bring those out for each student. We feel like we want to do that in a flexible environment. Um, so gone are the days of rows of desks and a teacher at the front um, delivering information. It's now about how do I facilitate a classroom um, discussion? How do I bring in collaboration among the group um, so that we have flexible furniture? So we're trying to really tear down walls get rid of permanent fixtures and allow flexibility for the long term so that uh, these spaces can continue to change as time evolves. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question for the architect? Yes, of course. Okay, great. Thanks. Before you, before you do that, if I can interrupt, yeah. can, can I just ask you a, a little more specific on, on the numbers? You're, you're saying 625 to 675. Is that your student population per class expected over the next 10 years? Is that relatively stable? It, yeah, the student population is relatively stable. What we've seen across the district over the last 10 years is declining enrollment. Um, last school year, in, in our fiscal year 2018-19, we saw increasing enrollment for the first time in a decade. That was great news for the district. Um, what we've seen uh, really in the city um, is a, a reduced number of school-aged children within the city. And I think that's a product of just Eden Prairie is a wonderful place to be, right? Um, so our empty nesters are staying longer in their homes. We're not seeing as much turnover and as many young families coming in. Um, and so our school age population is decreasing. We're at a point from a school district standpoint where we're seeing ourselves um, have slight declines, but really leveling off. So this year we're down about just under 1% for enrollment. Um, and over the last three years, um, we're pretty much flat. Um, and as we project forward, we think we're going to go down maybe 1%, 2% over that decade time frame, but pretty stable. Okay. So as I talk about class size, um, 625, maybe up to 700. So the cafeteria is being built to handle just over 700 students. Um, so we have a little bit of room for growth should that happen. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to interrupt. No problem. Thank you for keeping, keeping on topic with things. Commissioner Farr. Um, the renderings around the building were very helpful, of course. Uh, oh, I'm curious about the visibility from Highway 212. I know there's a significant grade change there, and uh, you're putting up the, the taller performing arts center up against that frontage, I suspect. Right. Did you look to see if there were visual impacts to Highway 212? I would imagine still positive, but, but uh, just curious about that. 
Yeah, we actually didn't do a perspect or a, a, a study from 212. I that the that sound wall is pretty tall along there. It is. I and mean, we can we can actually do that. We can get down there and look if we needed to. Um, that's that's a study we didn't do. I, I I my belief is the impact is fairly minimal from 212. Um, but we we once again we can do that. So. Okay. There's no effort to exploit that exposure by putting the EP logo on top of the There hasn't flyer. been, it really hasn't been part of our discussion. And okay. you know, that's the tallest part of the building. And in, in reality, if you look at the way we did uh, create the massing for the building, we're trying to minimize the scale of that, uh, the, of the fly loft, just because it's, uh, they can get really oppressive, and especially for younger children to be up next to them. So we intentionally are trying to push it back into the building. Okay. So to answer your question, there really was, hasn't been uh, a discussion about that. But you, if, if you look at our perspectives, I think we signed the building in a really you know elegant way, and I think that's the direction that we would go. Okay, thank you. Um, two other architectural questions. On the east side, when you were going through that design with the renderings, um, we hadn't seen a floor plan before tonight on the, on the PowerPoint. Um, so it looked like you had a two-story element in the middle of that facade. We do. So um, uh, uh, can you go to the, oh, let's see, can I? Uh, let's see if we can, how do I? Okay. Oh, okay. So there, there actually is a two-story element. Um, it, it is in between, so in, if you go, yeah, so that's the element you're talking about. Yep, there. and even the slide before that showed it more clear. Uh, yep. There you go. So can we go to plan? So that would have been way back just after the, uh, the first slide. This one? Uh, the next one. One more. So if you look at the white space up a, in between the green classrooms to the, the plan north or the far east, and the orange and yellow ones to the plan south or the west, there's a white space in the middle. Above that white space is a clear story uh, element. And, and the intent there is to try to get, to get light deep into the classrooms. So the, the classrooms along the east side, they'll get plenty of light because they're right on the, on the glass. The classrooms to the back, the orange and the yellow ones, they're interior classrooms and so what we're trying to do is use that clear story to get daylight deep into the classroom. So it's not a second floor. No, no, it's, it's a, just it's high a clear glass story element. And, yep. and that elevation is set back from the, the main east facade accordingly. Yes. Yep. Okay, that's what I was curious about. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then on the opposite side of the building on the west, uh, that entrance where you're taking down the canopy, it's a little bit of a hike there from the parking lot, I know. And that's always been notorious from a wind standpoint. And with your uh, new Performing Arts Center there, I think that's going to be a very uh, windy place with circulating uh, gusts a lot. And I just want to encourage you to think about wind uh, impacts, maybe some wind walls uh, using strategic landscaping or something like that to cut down on the breezes. Uh, again, it's a long walk from the parking lot and um, it's, it's a tough area for so wind right there. do you know, I'm just kind of curious, uh, uh, it, is the wind coming from the north in that in that area? G or? Generally northwest, yes. It is a cold walk. I, yeah. I would think that our, our Performing Arts Center should block a lot of that, I think. It's hard to really know if you look, because our Performing Arts Center is blocking the north side, uh, the, the uh, wind from the north, if you will. Yeah. A exactly. little bit. I, it's hard to know. Yeah, I don't sure. want to get at the wind design, but I think as the wind comes around, then it'll swoop inside that curved area, and it'll just create a little vortex there. So we can we can probably address that, or, or try to address that at any rate with uh, plant material. Keep, keep in mind with some yep. landscaping, I think, and other elements if you can. Yep. Thank you. That's it? That's all. Okay. Commissioner Sink. I have a, several mis miscellaneous questions, so I'm not sure who to direct this to first, but uh, in reviewing the minimization of the impervious surface, if you could perhaps address that, um, what about increasing then the pervious surfaces, the hard surfaces near the Performing Arts Center? Um, do you have any plan how to capture, recapture water that uh, would be accumulating in that area? We've, the island areas obviously as, as required as are uh, soft areas. Um, the 
tried to go heavy, obviously, on the native plants and the and the grassed areas around the. Um, and I don't know, Julie, if we can pull up the site plan again. The um, we looked at putting an infiltration area right off the corner of the. Can we have the, the PowerPoint, please? There. Sorry. Yeah. Um, right off the lower left side of the performing arts here, are those three little trees that I've shown, we looked at putting in an infiltration base in there. It just proved itself that it's better to go grass and get everything up to the bigger infiltration to the north. Um, we do have a, an outdoor performing arts theater that's terraced grass areas in that landscaped nook. Um, but again, trying to, again, maybe, maybe that'll help decrease some of the wind, but to try and get again some of the, the folks outdoors when, when they can. Um, but uh, trying to minimize the amount of pavements. We're not, we're looking to direct people as quick as we can to get inside or outside. And for instance, outside the main entrance on that west side, that semicircular area, um, right now that's a wide open concrete area that it's maintenance costs, it's any number of things right now. It's, it's got uh, heaved panels, we're trying to reduce that. That's gonna be landscaped. So again, an effort is really made trying to minimize the amount of walkways and sidewalks and, and obviously taking away some of the hard surface in the parking lot to turn into green space. My next question has to do with the tree removal. As you know, there are a fair number of trees, some very mature trees, large caliper trees that line the noise wall. It's on yep. the east side of the noise wall for quite a distance back down toward the uh, kindergarten center uh, area. When I looked at the proposed, uh, your architectural renderings, I was wondering about what percent of those large caliber trees would be removed from the immediate area east of that r noise wall. Of the sound wall? Very the sound few. Wall. I, we actually show where that north drive comes off of the west parking lot. I'm showing added landscaping there between the, right, between the drive and the sound wall. There are no trees there now. Um, most of them are north. You can see, yeah, the, the really dark arrows, you can, yep, the shaded areas. There are trees getting taken down there because that north drive is fairly low. Just to the north of that, we're putting in the basin. Again, some of those trees are being taken out. All those where the cursor is now, those are existing, those are really dark. Um, blobs those are the existing trees so again we've tried to minimize because of the grading because of the grade adjustments again there's so much relief out there we're trying to the, the conversation was um, that sound wall and how much of the performing arts theater is going to be seen we're trying to push that down as much as we can just because of the amount of fill that's going to have to go in there to if, if we had to build it up so we're trying to lower that and with that unfortunately we're having to take out some trees I don't know the percentages on whole um, we're replacing, I think we're within 50 caliper inches of replacing all the trees that we, rec uh, that we need to. Most of the mature trees are down around the basin south of the school. As you proceed with construction on the far southwest end of the property, west of the old kindergarten center, there is a peace garden in the very west, near the west entrance. Okay. And I'm concerned about that being protected do you know where that is? It's, there's a bench there, I believe. It's in that very quiet corner in the far oh, southwest okay. part, um, west part of the kindergarten center. Yeah, it's right up against the building in yes. a sense. Um, yep, the, the intent is for that to be preserved with, with no change to that. All right. Uh, my next question has to do with the bluffs uh, to the northwest side of the school pond area, which now is heavily wooded. Do you anticipate preserving the large caliber trees on the banks, the embankments, on the west side of School Pond and on the north side of School Pond? Yes. Yeah, we're not, we're not getting into the, the bluff area, the pond area. We're, um, we're staying out of that area. All right. Another question I have is I appreciate the consideration and thought you're given to the traffic flow at the choke point of School Road and Scenic Heights. And in reading some of the drafts, I came across the notion that, well, there's possibly a mini roundabout option pending the traffic data, study data, 
or a turning lane. Now, as you know, there is a macadam hard surface trail immediately to the south of Scenic Heights Road. It parallels it. Is there any reason that you could not build or widen that intersection to the north where that large embankment is and leveling that out and then allowing for a turning lane? Because I'm thinking there are a lot of people who come off 212 who are perhaps working at the city center, at the city administrative center, that could just go through on the right lane. So is there any uh, obstacle to widening or flattening out that intersection to accommodate a turning lane, left turning lane? I think any, anything is on the, the possibility rule right now. The, it's going to be a geometric uh, exercise on, obviously, the property is just to the south of that intersection. The bluff and the pond just to the north west of that intersection, the steep grade up to the school building on the northwest corner of that. So it's it's really going to be a, a method of, of uh, pushing and pulling. But obviously the intent is to try and keep that path as straight as possible. As well, trucks that are, aren't, aren't coming up school road need to get through in an east-west, basically, direction. So that's, I think, part of the, the design that, that that consultant is working on right now is that smaller roundabout may have the internal part of that the center of the circle may be surmountable I think that's part of that design so that again it's it's not as heaved and and uh, bulbous as some of the roundabouts you see in like Highway 7 or even our city right. center or whatever. my last question perhaps should be directed to uh, you I, I forgot your name I'm sorry Jason Mutzenberger. Jason, as you know, security is a paramount consideration in our public schools. Is consideration being given to installing metal detectors, not just at CMS, but at all the schools in the district? Um, you know, we've done research on metal detectors over the years. Um, metal detectors um, certainly have some advantages, and I think they have some disadvantages, too. Um, and at this time, we've uh, decided that metal detectors are not the direction for the school district. Um, we uh, are preferring some other methods at this point, um, and it, those include our secure entrances at all sites that we have currently. Um, the, the entrances that will be uh, added or re redone at Central Middle School will include those secure entrances that will be staffed um, by district employees. Um, and then we have a number of safety features as well through uh, some of the glass um, features that we have in other places within the building. And, our ability to essentially corridor or lock down different areas of the building uh, through our safety plan. Mm -hmm. um, so at this time, we've uh, opted not to move towards uh, metal detectors. Um, they're very expensive. Um, uh, I think we see with uh, somebody as an expert is probably uh, TSA at the federal government level is probably known as one of the experts. And we see a lot of things still even come through uh, metal detectors that shouldn't. Um, so I don't think they're foolproof either. Um, unfortunately, I think we live in a day and age where if somebody wants to get in, they're going to get in um, if they really have uh, an intent to do so. So our job is to try and minimize um, that risk um, as much as uh, financially feasible uh, for us, along with training our staff uh, in what we can do. Um, we also know that we have a wonderful partnership with, with the city, um, and we absolutely love the uh, school liaison officers that we have. Um, one officer is stationed at Central Middle School for uh, most of the day every day, um, and she's a wonderful uh, part of that team that we have there. So I think um, there are lots of factors that go into student safety, uh, metal detectors being one of those. At this time, we've decided not to do that. All right. Commissioner Mitty. Now, I do have a couple comments after all this, um, but hopefully they're, they're quick and easy. I don't know if we can pull up the site plan again, if it's possible. Um, one comment I have, I know I think one of the waivers uh, on this proposal is that the fact that there's no um, parking lot island in the bus corral area, but I would suggest um, to consider uh, maybe in the center of the corral to do pervious pavers or something where, you know, you're not actually getting a ton of traffic over that center. I don't know how that interacts, if that's better or worse for the for the uh, underground storage tanks below it, but I, I guess as sort of a compromise, I think that could be a, um, just a helpful uh, middle ground on, on the elimination of an island there. And then um, the other thing 
that as I'm just looking at the site plan kind of looks a little funky to me is um, on the north side of the site where this northern road that comes around, how it kind of loops all the way uh, around the top of the bus corral area. It almost seems like, so there's what appears to be maybe four bus slots at the top of, at the, top of the corral. Just to the west of that, couldn't that road just kind of swing right through in front of those um, even a little bit left yeah, um, to where Julie's doing it. And I know that then you have kind of the, maybe the, well, there's a crosswalk there anyway to get to the, to the field, but I, it just seems like a big loop around. I know there's a lot of stuff going in there, so I probably don't appreciate like why that can't happen. I get then you have that in between, you know, some bus stalls before, but I imagine those bus stalls aren't used a lot or are only used for like sporting events and not during the normal drop off hours. So. Uh, that seems like that could eliminate, you know, a good chunk of that road and make things a little bit more efficient. But again, if I understand if that's not possible with kind of what else is going on there. So to answer your first question on the porous pavers, uh, as whether it's brick pavers or, or porous concrete, in the island area, all for it. Um, typically, though, in order to get the water to get through those porous pavers, if we're looking to try and minimize the hard surface, otherwise if they're brick, they're still hard. Mm -hmm. The slope on that, as you can probably appreciate, is we're not maxing it out by any means, but it is, it's still three, four percent as it cuts across from east to west, no, west to east. And so runoff is gonna pass right over those pavers. Okay. Um, ultimately, you wanna either be flat or almost less, you know, just yeah, less I than- I envisioned uh, that maybe that corral kind of Dips in the middle. Would love but, to, but yeah, yeah it's, we've got so many um, hurdles grade wise there that we unfortunately can't do that. Uh, yeah, I'd love to have an island in the middle that's landscaped as well from a plowing, from a circulation. It, it just, it's, it's very tight. Um, by the book, that's, uh, that's tighter than a bus corral I normally design, but it works for them now. And so it's going to work for them in the future, um, <laughs> <laughs> at least the geometry of it. Um, the north connection, we went back and forth on this a little bit. The reason it is where it is, we didn't want to um, cut the buses, and those buses are there during the, the uh, afternoon pickup. Morning drop off, the buses come in, they just drop off and they leave. Afternoon pickup, I went out there, and I, if I remember right, the buses all came in in about a 10 minute period, 207 to 217. They're all staged there, including the three or four special ed buses. By 228, they're gone. It's amazing how fast they're gone. And so the, the intent with that Northern Connection is to not bisect any of those buses. If there's a parent that for some reason comes further down, if, if that drive were to be where the special ed buses are, they all of a sudden cause havoc. So we're trying to get them as far easterly, and then when they do exit, they're just leaving. They're going right down the hill. They're not impacting the bus staging, stacking, circulation. That bus corral is kind of its own entity. The connection of that intersection is there just to get people out. Mm -hmm. I would add to that too, and you know, our, our goal is we're trying to get the parents out as quickly as we can, um, still to address the traffic flow that we have coming off School Road and Scenic Heights there. Um, so if we have the ability to let parents flow around the building to the north and exit out onto Wallace, I think we have a lot of people that would take advantage of that. We want to keep that traffic as far away from our buses as we can, um, and initially we would start with that being a staffed kind of intersection in a sense, or a, a, a stop sign. Um, where we could staff it and, and direct those parent traffic out, make sure they avoid the buses. Um, parents are gonna be there to pick up students. Um, they're there very early. Some pick up students before that bell rings at 217 or 220. So um, those parents can go right away, even while buses are still parked. So we want, want that parent traffic to continue to flow as long as it can um, before we need to stop, let the buses exit, and then continue let that traffic flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understand. Is, is there, no, currently parents can't because there's a road there now. But do parent are parents able to take that or not? No, it's okay. a a fire road right now, so it's just a one lane road that goes around. Um, and right now we don't allow uh, parent traffic on that road. Yeah, well, I imagine that'll be a big improvement to yeah. have that added. 
yeah, the added road is a it's a two lane, two way road. So I think we'll see lots of traffic mm -hmm. being able to take advantage of that, which should really help the bottom of School Road and Scenic Heights. Mm -hmm. For sure. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, Farr, I don't want to beat a dead horse on that issue, but Commissioner Maddie brings up a good point about just the, the, the that area of conflict there, and I want to make sure we're not trying to just achieve too much and accommodate too many people who have things on their wish list instead of a want list for a school where safety is paramount. And again, I'm just going to go back to my point about um, uh, incentivizing parrots somehow with a different strategy rather than... Um, making it even more convenient for them. And in the process of making it more convenient for them, you're having them come in and out at a hairpin turn in a bus exit where there's a high uh, volume of traffic, extremely high volume of traffic for 20 minutes, kids running all over the place, parents trying to get to wherever they're trying to go to, and, and you have a hairpin turn. And it's a smaller design than he's used to. And I'm just thinking, e, you know, why why are we even trying to do that instead of maybe helping to solve the problem in the first place and incentivize parents not to, or or make it, or keep the pain there. And if you don't mind, Jason, I just want to tack on to that. I was going to comment on that, on that earlier too. And you said it right at the beginning about how do we incentivize parents to you know have their kids take the bus. I you know if I had a suggestion, it's not about communicating to the parents. It's the kids. I imagine a lot of things that they learn and do nowadays is about sustainability. They're learning to recycle all these things. If you can also teach the kids like, hey, like, you you know, it's better if you take the bus. Like, and if you want to do that to help, you know, reduce your carbon footprint, talk to your parents and tell them, you know, I think it's better if I take, you know, I think, I think educating from, from the student perspective is also an angle to go at it. So I'm just tacking that on. I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Julie, will you be doing the planner's report? Yes, sir. So the school district uh, gave a very thorough presentation of what the project all includes. So my comments, I think, will largely focus on the process uh, portion of, of the application. So as you know from your staff report, the application includes several requests. Uh, the property is proposed to be rezoned to public. Right now it is a, I'm going to say a handful of other zoning districts uh, kind of tossed together because we've got multiple parcels that make up the overall campus. So along with a rezoning request to it rezone the entire property to public. There is also a preliminary plat request to take those multiple parcels and create a single lot rather than having all of these lot lines and things that are running through the properties right now. In addition, they are asking for a PUD concept review and a PUD review with waivers. So I believe they've got six or seven waivers that they are requesting, and I'm just uh, going to go through those briefly for your review. The first is building height. The building height is proposed to exceed code requirements because of the fly loft in the theater and also because of the new gymnasium that is proposed for construction. The gymnasium is just shy of a two feet <coughs> taller than code requires and the fly loft is considerably higher than that but the fly loft is stepped back from the wall facade so it doesn't have that same impact as if the total building was, was that height. They are requesting a setback for the front yard parking lot. This is an existing condition, so it is not proposed as a part of the new construction that is going on. It is, it is something that was not documented the last time this uh, <coughs> property went through a project review, so we're kind of catching that this time around and making sure everything uh, is noted in the approval. The facade articulation with the recent design guidelines and city code uh, requirements with regard to building materials and architectural design, code now requires facades over a certain length to have some facade articulation, some wall deviations, that type of thing. The, gymnase, the facade of the gymnasium does not include that because, of course, of the type of uh, facility that that is. Uh, <coughs> is. There is a variety of other articulations built into the overall campus, but this facade does not include that, so a waiver is proposed. 
Additionally, the building materials, so the commission is very familiar with the fact that city code requires each facade to have 75% class one material, 25% class two material. The campus does provide that. Where this waiver is being requested is because code also kind of digs a little deeper into that 75% class one and says that you should use three complementary but contrasting materials. So the school does provide 75% or more greater class one materials, but they're achieving that through only two comparable materials. So brick, even though they're, as you can see on your um, sample board in front of you, there are two different colors of brick. <coughs> brick is still only one material. So that necessitates a waiver to have only two materials instead of three. The fence height, uh, the fence height in code is limited to seven feet. They're proposing an eight foot fence around the running track. That's consistent with what you'd see on other school facilities in city parks as well. <clears throat> uh, so that is a waiver that we want to address on the front end rather than when they come in uh, for the building permit. And then of course, as Commissioner Meddy spoke to the parking lot islands within the bus drop off area. As you know, when we updated the code to improve parking lot design and address islands, that was intended to address commercial office and industrial areas, not necessarily a bus drop-off area where you've got buses rather than, say, large or regular-sized personal vehicles. So uh, staff is comfortable with that waiver as well. I did want to touch on the fact that the school district is proposing a considerable amount of sustainable features within their project, and those are listed in your memo. There's roughly, I'm gonna say, eight to 10 of those um, that are proposed. For instance, an EV charging station is being proposed. The development agreement will address the timing and installation of that. As well, you can see there are other you know, LED lightings, solar arrays, um, sunshades, things of that sort uh, that will be integrated into the project overall. And lastly, before I get into the staff recommendation, I just want to note that because this is a public process, um, the school district does have to go through the bidding process just like the city does on any public projects. So what you see before you is the school district's um, proposal at this time. Of course, if they go through the bidding process and depending on how those bids come back, there may, may be some bid alternates in order for them to address <clears throat> um, their financial needs as well as meet the intent of the approval. So there has been ongoing conversations between city staff and the school district about the need to communicate about any bid alternates um, that might be proposed or <coughs> contemplated to ensure that moving forward any uh, pending approval would reflect uh, what was intended through the review process. So I, I just wanted to raise that in case you, any of you have any questions. And staff is recommending approval of the project subject to the conditions listed in your staff report. As you can see, there are a number of items that will need to be addressed prior to city council review or city council public hearing. L largely those are detailed items. Um, the school district has been made aware of those and has been diligently working to address those so we will need to receive additional information from them on those items prior to the City Council review but staff is comfortable with the project moving forward at this point subject to that information being revised and submitted so for instance they're 13 inches short on their landscaping requirement we need to see a new landscaping plan that makes up that difference there are some other utility connection and um, information that needs to be provided we're asking for that to be submitted to staff to confirm firm before the city council has a chance to look at the um, project through the public hearing process. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, or defer them to somebody else. Great, I, I do have one question. Yeah, Commissioner Kirk. Uh, Julie, could you maybe address the Scenic Heights School Road issue and what the process is going forward? We read the traffic report. We saw the alternatives. We discussed that a little bit earlier. What's the process uh, that will take place there? And, and, and just if you could explain that a little bit to us. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, that is a great question to defer to Mr. Rue. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, um, with, the, with the 
traffic study that you saw in the packet, um, it's they're analyzing different options as <coughs> to how to handle that. Um, the current condition as it is today with a with a, a stop sign for school road is is intended to be uh, kind of the the plan going forward uh, with that north loop as the as was discussed as well having that north loop road for to relieve some of that uh, there's also some on-site improvements that i think are beneficial the the much longer drop-off area from 200 up to 700 feet will help a lot the circulation in the parking lot will help um, we think that'll help uh, do a lot to relieve that uh, that short-term issue we have on scenic heights um, there was mention of a of a roundabout either a roundabout or a mini roundabout um, that's probably the best solution but it would be something that would be initiated by the city at a later date there would be some commitment from the school district regarding a financial contribution in the future as well as um, any easements or right away that might be needed in addition to that it's just too early at this point to know exactly um, as part of the improvement of this site plan the intersection improvements are not included they'll be they'll be handled at a later date knowing this is a di always a difficult question to answer any idea on on timing or budget horizon or for city action on scenic heights that would include improvement of that intersection well this is our in 2020 is the year we do our cip and this will be an intersection that will be looking at to slot in in the next uh, you know five to ten years um, maybe sooner depending on what we come out with at the the final report that, that comes out with the study traffic final traffic study uh, that might determine kind of where we try to get that improvements uh, planned for and budgeted for and that'll also give them the school district time to to budget for their share of the improvements as well so foreseeable future but probably several years out um i don't know it, it could be earlier than that but okay thank you the questions for the city mr chairman yes yep. mr Farr. um i have a question about the shoreland setback in the staff report uh calculates a number of percentages of impervious surface within the shoreland and i just want to make sure that i understand um in, they're planning this they're combining some lots so there's multiple lots that add up to about 57 acres are the percentages that are quoted are they tied at all to the what <clears throat> the smaller lot adjacent to that wetland shortland area or is it over the entire 57 acres or is it just the shoreland zone within that zone that it's being computed Mr. Chair, members of the commission. So historic, going back a little bit, um, I believe it was in the early 2000s, the school district went through a process and received a variance to exceed the 30% impervious surface percentage allowed. And at that time, it was looked at as the entire campus. So there was a final order that you're familiar with when the city approves a variance. It approves a final order. The legal description attached to that final order references the entire um, school campus. So that variance was given to the entire campus area rather than looking at it on a parcel by parcel basis. So the fact that they're now taking multiple parcels and combining them into a single parcel um, essentially is a non-issue because all of the same properties are covered under that existing variance. Perfect. Does that help? Yes, that's okay. exactly the answer I wanted. Um, the second question had to do with the waivers. The last waiver about those parking lot islands again in that bus drop-off area doesn't bother me at all. But I did notice on the site plan that there's uh, some additional yard space available in the front yard facing Wallace still. And I was wondering if you had the applicant explore widening the bus uh, radius there at the bottom end uh, to put that center landscape feature in maybe in lieu of parking lot islands that the buses would drive around which would increase the radius of, for the bus um, even if it possibly would create a, a front yard setback variance um, and I didn't know if that was a talking point during design review Mr. Chair, members of the commission, that was something that was not explored specifically. Um, I think we could have a conversation with the development team and, and um, judge the impacts of that and to at least take a look at it. Thank you. Other questions? 
Okay, this is a public hearing. If anyone would like to come forward and speak for or against this project, please do so now. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, move to close the public hearing. All right, motion right. by Commissioner Kirk to close the hearing. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Sanctus. All those in favor of closing the public hearing say aye. 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 Opposed? Public hearing is closed. Any further discussion? I just Commissioner want Mayor. to add um, the comment that I was very pleased with the architecture of this. Uh, you know, the, the second I opened it up and I saw the color rendering, I was just like, bam, this is, I think, to me, what we're trying to do here in Eden Prairie. Um, so I think it's something to be proud of, and uh, the architects did a great job with it. So thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to add a comment that I really appreciate your consideration of solar panels. I understand the uh, limitations in having a green roof, I guess, with the long beam on one of the buildings. Um, I'm really gratified that you were thinking in those terms and that the new expansion on the east side will admit much more natural light. We all know how important natural light is to the learning of our children. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Kirk. Move to recommend approval for a planned unit development concept review on 57.4 acres, planned unit development review with waivers on 57.4 acres, and planned site and site plan review on 57.4 acres. Preliminary plat of multiple parcels <coughs> into one lot on 57.4 acres based on plan stamp dated November 27th, 2019, and the staff report dated December 3rd, 2019. All right, I have a motion for Commissioner Kirk. Do I have a second? Second. Second for Commissioner Meddy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And would anyone like to abstain? All right. Thank you. Nice job in that. I echo other sentiments up here. It really looks nice and updated. And I have the first of three coming through CMS next year. So I look forward to seeing this project. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice project. Hold them yeah, back good a project. To... I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving on this evening, I believe we have another public hearing. Code amendment for R1 9.5 side yard setbacks 2019 25. This is a request to amend the city code chapter 11 relating to R1-9.5 side yard setbacks. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the R1-9.5 zoning district is the city's smallest single family residential zoning district. Um, as you're well aware, the last several development projects that have come through the process and been reviewed by you have included a request to rezone to R1-9.5. So being that this, uh, pro this zoning district was created in 1992, or excuse me, 82, 1982, it lagged a little bit behind in the creation time uh, from when the R144, R113.5, R122 districts were created. At that time, the city was really looking to accommodate a smaller lot, understanding that there might be a need for that or different types of homes being designed. And at the time that the zoning district was created, the side yard setbacks uh, language includes something that's uh, frankly rather cumbersome and open to interpretation um, that could be applied inequitably or inconsistently. So staff is recommending that the code be amended in order to provide a little more clarity and consistency with how this zoning district handles side yard setbacks compared to the other existing zoning districts. So right now the R195 zoning district says um, five feet on one side for a total of 15, but it goes on to provide some very cumbersome language. It says if you're a single car garage, then you have to have, I think it's seven feet on one side and 17 on the other, um, or something for a total of 27. If you're a double car garage, it provides a different um, calculation. Now, I think the, st the staff report provides the exact number, but I think we've had only three or four examples of a single car garage being constructed since uh, this requirement was put in place so you can see that it's very underutilized and not really <coughs> realistic in today's condition in addition the PUDs and the recent requests that we've received uh, for developments in the R195 tend to 
uh, request side yard setbacks of seven and a half feet and seven and a half feet on each side in order to provide that total of 15. So maintaining the spirit and intent of that 15 feet of separation, just kind of redistributing it a little bit. So staff is proposing an amendment that would allow a minimum side yard setback of five feet on one side and then a total of 15 on the whole lot. So in essence, you'd get one side at five feet, one side at 10 feet, or they could come in and do seven and a half and seven and a half, and that would be compliant and not require a waiver as well. That is how the other zoning districts handle side yard setbacks. So this would be applied in a very similar approach and reduce the uh, amount of potential interpretation and potentially inequity in how it's applied throughout the community. So staff has taken a look at existing R195 properties and how they've been applied. The way this wording is proposed does not create any new non-conforming situations. So we've addressed the um, existing conditions as well. So staff is recommending approval of the text amendment and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Julie. Any questions? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Farr. Sorry. Um, I'd like to know what the city's thoughts are on backyard access for service vehicles, whether they be private service vehicles for tree clearing or uh, access to public D and U easements that may occur in the rear yard of properties like this. Um, with the five and a total of 15, if someone does choose the seven and a half, seven and a half, uh, that does limit the ability for a service vehicle to enter the backyard. And I know there's a lot of side yard obstruction possibilities like trees, shrubs, fences, air conditioning units on the ground, and grade changes. But um, is, is that at all of concern if someone uh, has a side yard on, on both sides of their property, which uh, would not be able to navigate a, a service vehicle uh, to the backyard? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I'll take a first stab at answering that and I'd welcome any comments from um, other staff as well. I'm not aware that there have been any concerns. The city does have a, a healthy amount, I'm going to say, I don't know the number right off the top of my head, a healthy amount of properties that are zoned R195 scattered throughout the city um, that have occurred since 1982 when that zoning district was created. Uh, I'm not aware of any instances where there have been issues getting service vehicles to the backyards, um, but other staff may have other information that they'd wish to share. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, I, um, the situations that we run into are more for our service crews. Um, most of the time, if we do have a, a public utility, normally a catch basin or some type of uh, a sanitary manhole or something that might be in the backyard, we generally have a wider, uh, wider easement to, in, in which to we can access. Your point about obstructions in those easements are always something that we have to deal with fences shrubs trees um, grade changes retaining walls along the right away or along the property <coughs> lines um, that's something we have to deal with quite often um, but i can't recall any specific areas where we've had um, a tight corridor like this there's usually some place where we can get to their uh, backyard uh, if we do have some infrastructure back there. So I'm not aware of any specific example. Okay, all right, as long as that was thought through. Thank you. Okay, great, other questions? Okay, this is a public hearing. If anyone would like to come forward and speak for or against this amendment, please step forward now. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I move to close the public hearing. All right. Motion by Commissioner Medley. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Kirk. All those in favor of closed public hearing say aye. 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 Opposed? Public hearing is closed. Uh, any discussion? All right. Someone like to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I would move to recommend approval to amend City Code Chapter 11 regarding side yard setbacks in the R195 zoning district based on the information included in the staff report dated December 4th, 2019. I have a motion from Commissioner DeSanctis. Do I have a second? 
I'll second that. Second with Commissioner Farr. Are those in favor of approving? Say aye. 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 Opposed? And would anyone like to abstain? All right, it's passed. Congratulations, city. <laughs> All right, moving on, it looks like we have a planner's report this evening. Yes, yes sir. Uh, now that it is the end of the year, we're looking forward to our 2020 work plan. As some of you who've been on the commission a little while, longer than others know, the planning commission doing a work plan is something new that we've probably started within the last, I'm gonna say four or five years. Prior to that, uh, the planning commission's work plan was completely reactive uh, to the applications that might be submitted to the city. So in the last few years, what we've tried to do is identify those maybe city-led initiatives that might cause some time and commitment to be provided by the, by the planning commission. So as you can see, the work plan that is uh, prepared and presented before you this evening talks about in the first quarter doing a, the planning commission training curriculum that we've talked about in the past. Um, and in fact, I'd like to talk about that after this item with you a little bit. And then the other quarters largely um, focus on code amendments to begin the implementation of the recently approved Aspire document. So there are some new zoning districts that will need to be created in order to address new land use categories. There will be some tweaking, if you will, of the zoning ordinance to align comprehensive plan policies with the action items in the zoning ordinance. So <coughs> staff is working on an internal working document to figure out the best timeline to address those specific topics and bring those back um, for you. So staff is recommending approval of the work plan that is presented to you this evening, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any comments that you might have. Should you as a commission recommend approval of, or take action to approve the work plan, this is the work plan that would be presented to the plan, or excuse me, city council at their work session in February. All of the advisory commissions have an opportunity to present their work plan, present their um, accomplishments from the last year to the city council in a work session format, and that would be carried forward at that time. So again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions? I think we have any. Very good. No. Can, I, no? okay. can I have a motion? Do you want it approved? Yes, right. please. Do I have a motion to approve the 2020 goals and work plan? I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Right. Motion from Commissioner Farr. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Commissioner Meddy. All those in favor of approving the work plan say aye. 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 Opposed? Would anyone like to abstain? <clears throat> All right. The work plan is approved. Thank you for putting that together. Mr. Chair, can I add one other item? Of so along that front, uh, there, yeah, your, your next meeting will be January 13th. And at that point, staff would like to bring forward the planning commission training curriculum to you to do a kind of a practice run. Uh, we've been putting that information together and refining it to um, our liking, but what we'd like to do is do a practice run with all of you in order to get your feedback and then further refine that training before the new commissioners um, get appointed in February and then begin their term in April. So that if you offer your comments, we can improve the presentation even more and then share it with the new commissioners because there will be six uh, seats up for consideration this year with the um, reappointment of folks so there could potentially be a lot of new faces um, and we'd like to get your feedback as tenured members of the of the commission so I just wanted to share that with you that we would will have that for you on the 13th of January okay. thank you all right, moving on, any members' reports? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to make a comment about the first public hearing that we had this evening about the Central Middle School. Um, it wasn't, an, I didn't bring this up because it wasn't directly uh, applicable to the application at hand, but I noticed that the uh, uh, Performing Arts Center had a sign over the entrance doors that said Performing Arts Center. And in today's day and age, um, uh, naming rights um, our uh, topic of conversation for a lot of public and private institutions. And uh, frankly, I don't know if our Eden Prairie School District allows for or um, suggests naming uh, of facilities like this within our district. And so I'm, I'm speaking a little bit out of, 
out of turn there. Uh, that said, uh, Central Middle School has had uh, Principal uh, Joe Epping, who passed away suddenly about, what, is it two years ago now, 18 months ago, who was principal of that school for many, many years. Yes. Uh, upstanding yes. uh, community member and uh, uh, leading Central Middle School for many years uh, successfully. And um, uh, I wish to as, as just a minimum throw his <coughs> name in the in possible hat of consideration for naming rights for the Performing Arts Center at Central Middle School, uh, Mr. Joe Epping. Thank you, appreciate that. You're welcome. Right. Any other members' reports this evening? All right, seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Meeting's adjourned.